98% of financial advisors do not understand the depths of the debt and the retirement crisis. And if they do, they won't talk about it. I think people are deserving to know both the positive that can happen and the negative. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special for February 28th through March 7th, 2023, while supplies last. This week we feature two coins from the Royal Canadian Mint. The sought-after 2013 Silver Pronghorn Antelope at $3.99 over spot, and the 2022 Silver Maple at $3.40 over spot. The Silver Pronghorn Antelope was made for the Low Mintage Limited Run Wildlife Series where just one million coins were minted over the course of six months and then never issued again. With a focus on beautiful design, a face value of $5 Canadian and RCM's strict four nines fine purity, these coins further add a degree of rarity to the mix. They come 25 to a tube, 500 to a box, and are available at just $3.99 over spot. We also have 2022 silver maples on special. Silver maples were the first silver sovereign coins to be minted at four nines fine purity and remain one of the most in-demand coins today. They come 25 to a tube, 500 to a box, and are available at the lowest premium we've seen in more than a year, at just $3.40 over spot. Both coins this week are also IRA eligible, and if you'd like to learn more about a precious metals IRA, call us and we'll be happy to help you in that process. To order these specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is Peter Grandich from Peter Grandich & Company. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Very happy to be back with you. Well, it's great to have you. Now, last time we had you on, we were talking a bit about the retirement crisis right now. And a lot of people, um, traditional investors, you know, are, have been losing a lot, you know, 30% or so. And if you add on inflation to that, it's even higher. So what is the crisis right now and where do you see it heading if you want to expand on that? Sure. So what I've been trying to talk for some time to people about and when the market was going strong, most didn't want to listen, is that with 75% of Americans on average working paycheck to paycheck, not only is it a struggle, <clears throat> excuse me, for daily getting by and they've had to use credit cards, you know, because things have gone up so much in price, but they haven't had an ability to save for retirement. So either those people are going to have to work for a very older age or they're gonna come like this to the government and say, you gotta help me. And now we saw last year, Fidelity came out with a study the other week that said that their average retirement account was down 24%. So if you take that and you add just 10% inflation over two years, I know it's a lot more, but you're basically lost a third of what you could have used your money for just a year or so ago. Now, of course, the don't worry, be happy crowd on Wall Street, Jake, don't worry, it always comes back. Problem is, like, it may not come back this time. There's been many times in the history of market. In fact, the Dow took almost 27 years to recover one time after the decline that it saw in the 30s. So there's a lot of struggling uh, to be had with. And the problem, as I was also sharing with you, is I hear in my 55 and over community, people know what I do. So I probably had four or five in the last week say to me, hey, Peter, do you know anything about XYZ Corporation? And I go, why? They say, well, the stock's down 20, 25%, which is bad enough, but I've been living off the dividend. Uh, is it safe? And I always tell them no corporate dividend is safe. A, a, a bond would be much safer because either they pay or they default. And we're now seeing some of the areas that people had flocked to for income. Remember, you know it, the Fed, destroyed the income market. They brought rates down to zero. People used to be able to shift out of stocks when they were worried and go in and get a nice bond return or a CD. And they used to give you toasters when you went and got a CD then back then. But now they went to much riskier investments. And the other area that's just starting to roll over now, and you're going to start to see people seeing the dividends cut or loss, and that's in the REITs, the, the Real Estate Investment Trust. That was another area that was pushed 
by the don't worry, be happy crowd for income. So all in all, when you take the debt problem that everybody knows about and the, re the coming retirement crisis, and one last thing, which I think is important, Elijah, when the inevitable happens, the people who are going to be taxed more are the people that will still be working five or 10 years from now. So there's going to be a battle of the ages, and here's how it's going to come. On one end, there'll be an 80 or 85-year-old man or woman who wants Medicare to pay a couple hundred thousand for some major heart transplant or whatever, and they feel they deserved it because they've been on Medicare. And the younger person who's now being taxed is going to say, wait a minute. Why should they, they live the life? I'm, I can't even live. I can't even put bread on my own table. Uh, no, no, no. He can't have that operation. Let him die if he wants to. And people go, oh, that's terrible. Well, in Canada, it's already happening. Canada passed a law and their health uh, groups are encouraging people that are old and very seriously ill to consider that as an alternative. And I think just just from a personal and spiritual standpoint, it, in, in a faith that teaches us to live at all costs, this culture of death now has entered even an economic uh, zone. It's not just social and political more, it's economically now. So this may not happen tomorrow, but if it's gonna be in Canada, you know, it, it doesn't mean it won't be here before too long. We already have several states that that allow people to commit, you know, end their own lives at their own choices. So uh, it, it, again, you're not gonna turn on Wall Street, you're not, listen, I'll tell you this much, and I, and I always get emails, but I don't mind. 98% of financial advisors do not understand the depths of the debt and the retirement crisis. And if they do, they won't talk about it. I think people are deserving to know both the positive that can happen and the negative. What you mentioned, I think, is really important because it's always in the face of a crisis, it's always important not to despair <laughs> and lose hope. Um, it's important to look at the crisis head on, acknowledge it and move forward. So what are some ways of people who are, uh, you know, and nearing their retirement age um, and are maybe seeing you know their portfolios down 30 or in reality 40 percent um what are some actions that they can take not ignoring the crisis not despairing but actually taking action and preparing um for their retirement years right now so in 2021 i became so bearish that i if people wanted to listen i said if you sold every stock or bond right now it wouldn't bother me because i think there's going to be enough loss in both of those markets that you can save principal and have a chance to re-enter it at lower levels. But at that time, I was talking to people about, listen, a lot of people in the United States go, the, traditional financial planning is a flawed process. And the reason I say it's flawed is because they're chasing net worth. They're trying to take past performance of a product and hope it performs the same or better going forward so the person could reach their goal, college savings, uh, retirement, and we try to talk about in our planning group that cash flow is king. And anybody who has a business or been in real estate knows how important cash flow is. So we would say to people who are hearing from a typical financial planner about the 4% rule, you're going to go on retirement. You need this amount amount. Take out 4% to live your ways. And the markets and our investments make it up. And, and you live happily ever after. And that's how it's sold. So we were talking to people that, well, Listen, we can actually get you guaranteed five or six percent without any having to worry. And they would say things like, I'm making five or 10 percent in the market a month or whatever, or cryptocurrencies going up to here and there. And besides, Peter, the difference of four to five or six percent is only percent or two. And I go, no, it's 25 or 50 percent more. And people go, what do you mean? 4% versus 6%, 6% is going to earn you 50% more than you would have with 4%. And then when we show them, you know, what, uh, just uh, on 100,000 income over 30 years, how it's like $1.4 million more to you. And then the few that made it to that point that haven't run to the guy or gal with the black box that cures everything, uh, our clients, you know, are quite happy at the moment. Now, of course, if the market turns around and goes up 50, 100 percent, they're going to not like us. But right now, uh, I would tell you that safety is paramount. I think this country faces. Listen, Elijah, I've shared this with you before and I shared it publicly. I've been so concerned about the economic, social and political atmosphere. It's impacted my mental health. I mean, it really has. 
I mean, that's how over the concern. And listen, I'm not selling dry food, ammo, you know, cabins in the woods, you know, to create this really negative scenario. It's just how I foresee it. And uh, it's very, very tough. You know, the seniors now have a huge problem. And, and please let me share this. This is really important. There are polls out there now where seniors have said they fear more of running out of money while they're alive than passing away. And it's hard for younger people because they're still working. They can't imagine, you know, that they could run out of money and not be able to pay things. But there are people already retired now that have that grave concern because of what, what is happening. So, uh, and, and it's all gonna come down to this, everybody's gonna go to the government, you have to help me. So it's whoever has the political power. Uh, most of the money still is with older people and if they use it right, they'll get the political will and probably get more favorable rulings for themselves. But young people today are becoming more political than they might've been when I was their age. So it, we, we're gonna have some most interesting times ahead down the road. Sorry for going on long, but you give me such an opportunity. A lot of people don't get to hear this. And I think it's just fair that people should hear the positives and the negatives, and then they can make the judgments on themselves. No, that's very good there. And we have a question here from a viewer that kind of gets into what you're saying, because if people do have to you know, put their hand out to the government, that's not a good thing that reduces people's freedom and all of that. Um, we have a question from Don. How do you build durable societal freedom? Um, so I think there's definitely a financial aspect to that. But if you wanted to take that uh, whatever way uh, you'd like to. Sure. So my motto, which has not led to more business, has led to less business, is I have a less is more attitude. I try to explain to people when we sit with them that our parents and grandparents didn't need public storage. You can't drive on a major road in any in any state and not come across public storage facilities. They didn't exist during our parents' and grandparents' times. In fact, our parents also lived in much smaller dwelling size than we did. They didn't have all that stuff. And the other thing they didn't have many times was a credit card. My father never got one. He used to say, if I can't pay for it, I don't want to own it. Now, younger people say, can we make the first payment? So I think how we live uh, for ourselves, irregardless of how what may affect us outside, is very important. Most of, most of the families that I see that come in at all levels of income are living above their income level from a conservative standpoint. They've extended themselves. They're living on debt. And debt doesn't have a positive verse in what I consider, and I believe you do as well, the manual to life, the Holy Bible. And so if God, the creator of the entire universe, and if you're not a believer, at least the creator of the greatest book that was ever read, doesn't say anything positive about debt, then maybe you should reconsider that. And, and I think those are starting points that can make at least life hopefully easier for you, despite how bad things may be getting outside your home. Now, we have another question here about building a business in these hard times. I think that may be a road ahead for some people who want to be entrepreneurial. Um, the question is, what businesses are good to start these in these times? As we transition or have a huge crisis, what would be the pros and cons of doing so? So part of our business, and I'm, this is a little reverse for a moment, and, and it's a little plug that I'm going to get in for ourselves, if you don't mind. We specialize in teaching people to get an exit strategy, how to maximize the value of the business and how to exit with the most money in their pockets. But I will tell you this, for those that are first thinking of starting a business, if you talk to most of those people that are looking to exit, they'll tell you basically that in the last 20 years, there hasn't been good fiscal policy for a small business owner. It's become tremendously more difficult now for a whole lot of reasons, over-regulation, cost, taxes, what it may be. So those are things you have to consider if you're even going to be starting a business. But there's two things I think are, that are fairly certain that are happening, that if I was not doing what I was doing, I would maybe look into, especially if I was a little younger. A, everybody's living longer and older people are downsizing. So if you're going to invest in real estate or you want to become a real estate entrepreneur, Stay away from the 5,000 square foot homes and look more at where people are being catered to, to what smaller and older people need. That, I think, is a growth business. The other is anything related to health. I mean, it's just a, it's 
always going up. So anything that can aid people in health and entertainment, because there still are 20 percent or so that have excess money and want entertainment and so forth. That would be another area that I think one can look at. Now, when it comes to investments, we have a few questions here on investing in the precious metal sector, which I understand that um, those are a few of the sectors that you are um, heavily invested in right now. Dave is wanting to know, I consider uh, his comments that I consider a solid position in gold and silver bullion to be indispensable. Should we also be in gold and silver miners? Well, the physical is always most important to have first, and not because I'm speaking with you. I'd say that to whoever I was speaking to, uh, because mining shares don't always recognize or perform the way gold does. So if you want to truly have gold's performance, own the physical first, and then own it for this reason. Own it and hope you never profit from it. Somebody goes, why would I want to buy something I can't profit from? I say, because chances are you're, you're very much invested on financial assets, whether you know it or not, your company pension, your 401k, whatever the case may be. Trust me, if gold's gone up a lot, chances are your financial assets, particularly equities, have gone down. So treat it like home insurance, car insurance. Hope you never have to use it if you have to do it. Now, if you want to look at it as a capital appreciation opportunity, I think because of you know, I believe I've stated this publicly and I'll say it again. I believe this will end up being the best global market in my career. And I'm going to be in, I'm entering my 40th year in and around the financial arena. And I say that with one really big reason, lots of little reasons. Central banks that just keep buying it. Like they are not buying it for a trade. They are not buying to speculate in it. They're buying because they're anticipating something where gold is going to be worth a lot more money. That's the only reason for them to want to do that. Some speculate there may be a change in the dollar to another currency. There may be a new new currency offered that would have some sort of gold backing. But whatever it is, since they're doing it, I rather bet on them than against them. Now, in terms of silver, because silver... It has a much more better industrial use, but it it's always this. I hate people get mad at me that it's silver buds, but I, it's the kissing cousin to gold. Gold tends to lead. But as I've stated, I believe one's gold goes through 2000. And that I obviously believe that's where I think it's going. I think it's going to draw many people who don't normally invest in that area. And that's when silver will, will take hold. Uh, it's more of a individual play people than, you know, as people treat gold. But I also think there are a lot of base metals because everybody has bought in, the governments around the world at least, I haven't, but the governments around the world have bought into this whole electrification thing. They're switching everything to cars, anything they can make. Well, there's two things they fall short on at the moment, and they're going to realize that sooner than later. A, they don't have all the minerals that are readily available that need to be in order to perform this. And they don't have the ability to deliver it. Here in the United States, we have blackouts and brownouts in many areas of the country now. Our electrical grid system is very old. I like to joke that Thomas Edison installed some of it. But the bottom line is a lot of money is going to have, be, have to be spent in order to deliver this electricity. And it takes us into another area that I'm bullish on, uh, uranium, because nuclear energy has made a 180 degree turn. You go to a politician 10 or 20 years ago and say, can we get a nuclear plant in our state? No way. Never again. Now they're like, please, please, can you build one so I don't have to hear from people that they're not getting all the electricity they need? So that's an area that that turned around. So gold first, silver, and then copper. Copper is my favorite base metal for the electrification and uranium. But they're not going to be rocket ships. And, And again, I hate to keep speaking on here, Elijah, but this is kind of important. I'm back on the internet. I I left Twitter when all the political stuff was happening and I went back in December, so I'm kind of watching it on a daily basis. People are spending too much time talking about these investments, gold, uranium, intraday, to the point where when you talk so much about something, the expectations build up so your timeline that you would give it shrinks. These things take time. You shouldn't be buying them expecting tomorrow to be verified that it goes up. And one thing I'll say about gold and silver, it is hated by the financial community in the United States, the mainstream. They treat it like kryptonite. 
simply because, as we just stated before, it goes against stocks and bonds. And, uh, and so I think the American public will only come in as a group once it's on the regular news. Hey, gold's just gone through 2000. Blah, 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 and that'll bring in uh, far more speculation, hot money, momentum money, whatever you want to call it. Regarding the topics of uh, precious metals versus the stock market, we do have a question regarding that. Um, Silver and gold have been said to be a store of value. Hypothetically, if $100,000 was invested in the stock market over the last 50 years versus purchasing gold and silver, how would both have fared? Well, it depends exactly where we start that point. So he has 50. I got to remember that that's got to be just about. Yeah, just about before gold became free trading. So it's kind of hard to take it because for so long, gold was fixed at, at a particular price. There's a guy out there now that's trying to, he's been a the biggest hypester. He should be, well, he should be put somewhere other than where he is currently now. And he's been taking like a Bitcoin at this point versus gold. Well, the point he's picking, I can pick eight that has shown that gold has been much better than, than Bitcoin. So all I can just say is this, the past performance, and that's why I, I believe regular financial planning is flawed, and they have it in their disclaimer. They tell you that. Past performance is no guarantee of future success, blah, 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 blah. It really doesn't matter what it did 50 years ago to now. It's only what you think it's going to do going forward. And I can just tell you this. Now, I don't own gold or silver because I think there's going to be Armageddon and I'm going to be able to get a loaf of bread when somebody can't because sooner or later, the people that don't have it are going to realize I have it and they're going to take it from me. But I do think from a pure capital appreciation and clearly as a safety vehicle, look at last year. Other than energy, gold outperformed everything. And a lot of people say it was a bad year. It was just barely broke even. All those people that were down 30 percent that we spoke about. They wish they were just even right now. So I only think what's important is what you think it's going to do going forward. And I certainly would own gold and silver right now before I would own general equities. And and just a question here, then you said past performance doesn't guarantee future results. Obviously, that's the disclaimer uh, everywhere. It does seem to. I mean, it seems like all we have, though, is past performance, right? We only have history to look at. Um, so when we when we look at I've heard the argument before, for example, for the stock market, you know, over the last hundred or so years, it's been about eight percent each year on average. So why do you see that changing then? And and why can't we just base our um, investment decisions purely on what has happened in the past? Because the economic, social, and political environment is totally different than 50 or 80 years ago. When I entered the business, the United States was the largest creditor nation. It isn't that anymore. When I entered the business, if anybody told us one day, if you last long enough, like I did almost 40 years, you're going to be talking about deficits, not debt, deficits of a trillion dollars or more. I say, you're crazy. It's not, no way it's going to be. Well, Guess what? It is. And a lot of the growth in the equity market the last 20 years is because of all the debt that was created. It was fine if you profited and got out. But we're at a point now, you know, CBO just came out with they're looking for another 19 trillion to be added to our debt over the next 10 years. That's going to get to a point, Elijah, where we're going to have trouble paying the interest on our debt. So I don't think the environment or the tools that would have allowed that average that you spoke about is going to be able to happen over the next five or 10 or even 20 years. Now, I'm probably 20 years not going to be around. If I am, I probably you know won't be able to speak to you in the same way that I'm speaking to you now. But anybody that thinks they're going to be, you can't look back of what has happened because so much of it was done from taking from the future. That's the way I like to describe it from people. All of that a lot of that was from the future. And now it's on the shoulders of the people that have to be around for the future to have a much more tougher environment than they might have had if people would have been smarter earlier before. I believe one last question uh, from Ken. He's wanting to know, he says that sometimes uh, when investing like in stocks and everything like that, he is trigger shy a bit. So how do you get past that uh, when you've 
made the decision, yes, I want to buy the stock and it's a good price and you know in your mind that it's a, it's a good idea right now, but you're just kind of shy about doing it. How do you get past that? Well, I have this rule, two rules, and I didn't listen to it for my own self last year and it cost me dearly. In the junior market, it, 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 you could take it for almost anything. The first rule is failure is the norm. Uh, more times than not, things aren't going to work out the way you think. Two, not only do you have to have the financial wherewithal, and I think a fair amount of financial advisors take into consideration financial risk when they sit with people. But where I don't think they measure at all, and this will cost a lot of people, is I don't think they measure the potential mental anguish you could have if it doesn't work out. So when they give plan A, they never talk about plan B. But when something goes wrong, the person comes in and that's when they present plan B because plan A didn't work. Uh, this is a, it, it's very hard. And that's why people that do technical analysis shy away from fundamental analysis because you have to make sometimes emotional decisions. And usually when you're highly emotional, you don't make great decisions for life, investments and so forth. Where a technician will just say, listen, when it goes to this price, it's formed this or that, you buy it or sell it. I think you have to have an understanding and a feeling of I can accept less than what I expect it to be. Therefore, I won't spend time worrying. And I'll give you an example. Over the years, I've had people come in of, of, that have been really blessed with wealth and they want to trade stock options. And I would my joke would be is, listen. What do you got in your wallet? And they would tell me, give me half of it. Take the wallet back and promise you're never going to buy options and you'll save 50 percent of all your money. And I say to them, well, why do you want to do that? Well, my friends and I want to no, stick to what you're good at. Some people are good. Some God's given them a gift to, and a handful. Remember, 80 percent of money managers underperform an index. Now, think about that. And this is Nobel laureate studies. Would you go to a doctor or a lawyer that you need in a case of eight out of 10 times they weren't successful? No. But yet everybody runs to, to, to certain money managers. So keep that in mind also. And that's why I think more people now, I'm noticing this, Elijah, when I'm talking to 30, 35 year olds, even 40 ish, many people are really investing on their own now. They're not running to financial advisor firms. And one of the reasons also is, is that those financial f service firms have really become asset gatherers. That individual, he or she is not actually making all the decisions. They're turning it over to a money management group and then they share in the fees that are collected on it. And so what do I need that? What do I need that middle person for? I can almost direct with money management and save on fees. So we're not big on that. We cut our nose despite our face telling our clients that, but like I said, it's, it's, it's not as easy. So that person I can understand, there's a lot of things to think about now when you make an investment. It's not simply the buy low and sell high, which, you, which it looks like when you watch their commercials, they're doing for you. All right. Well, Peter Grandich, we really appreciate your time today and all your insights. Where can our viewers find you online? And are there any last thoughts you'd like to leave with our viewers? Well, when I'm not hiding under my desk, you can find me at petergrandich.com, G-R-A-N-D-I-C-H.com. I'm also back on internet. I, for now, I'm enjoying it because I really haven't had any trolls show up yet. But I'm at Peter Grandich and I'm actually answering questions when people ask uh, on Twitter. So e either place you can, you can find me. Fantastic. Once again, Peter, thank you so much for your time and God bless. Thank you and God bless. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we can let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. 
The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself Kaiser, my brother Elijah, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.